One is going to be in New York, and one is going to be in Paris, France. So when James Deering does eventually retire from his vice presidency, he is going to then create his fourth home here, Vizcaya. Um, Vizcaya is going to be a bit of somewhat his retirement home, but also really his home for the winter. Um, Miami is perpetually summer all year long, so he really does come down here and have a lot of lavish parties that he hosts himself. Um, this guy would have seen anywhere between 100 to 150 guests during the months of November through April. So on top of that, we do have a lot of um, people who worked here as well. Um, the labor force when Vizcaya begins construction in 1914 is going to be around a thousand or so people. Um, eventually that does dwindle down the number, especially when Vizcaya completes its construction in 1916. Um, but the surrounding land, such as the gardens on the main house side of the um, property as well as the village side did take until 1922 to be entirely home. So staff were able to live here on site just depending on marital status as well as your gender. So if you were a single woman and you um, happened to work for James Deering, you were actually able to live in one of the guest bedrooms on the second floor in the main house. Um, there are also internal staff quarters that those women would have lived in if guests were staying over um, of James Deering. If you were a single man and you worked for James Deering, you would have been able to live in one of the apartment spaces here on site in the village. And in addition, if you had a household or family that you um, had here, you would have lived in one of the homes that were here in the village as well. So an example of that is actually going to be just across the street if you look through those windows. Currently, we do call that the Westgate Lodge, but on the entire right side of that sort of st um, structure that you see, that is where the chauffeur and his family would have lived. Um, and so currently, those are spaces that we have sort of adapted into being office spaces for current staff today. Um, but that is sort of the historical significance of the Westgate Lodge right over there. For this building right here, this is known as the garage. Um, the garage would have housed the nine or so vehicles that James Deering owned personally himself. If we actually look at this circle right here, it indicates the Lazy Susan that his vehicles would have been sort of um, stationed on. Um, there's no reverse mechanism back in the day yet, so what James Deering is going to do is actually sort of rotate the Lazy Susan to whatever car he wants to sort of roll out of here through those front entrance, through that front entrance that you see right over there. Um, if we would like to see a sort of archival photo of what the garage would look like back in the day, we do have one over here being on this wall. You can also see two of the vehicles that James Deering privately owned. And I can give you guys a couple of seconds to get up close and personal with it if you'd like. <laughs> yes, so this that you see right here, the entrance of the garage from the outside. So James Deering did purchase around 180 acres of land. This composed, of course, of the village, the main house, 
and then a bit more south um, where the lagoon gardens used to be. Today we are reduced to around 50 or so acres. We can kind of get more into that conversation towards the end of our tour. But some of the buildings that we do have on site or that we used to have on site are no longer in existence. So even though we may have the garage and the Westgate Lodge and the other buildings that we're going to sort of check out today, we do have what are called lost buildings. And I'm going to take us over here so that we can kind of see an example of the inside of the Shea House that James Mary used to have on the have the shade house back in the day but we also had a greenhouse as well shade house would have just sort of been more controlled light for a lot of the more special plants that you see right here greenhouse kind of does the opposite lets in all of that light but also kind of sort of controls the temperature or climate if you will inside so again a lot of the staff would have taken care of these and um, managed a lot of these things that these buildings that you see right here um, but they also used to be part of this village sort of side here in addition, we are also going to look at more of that land that I was talking about. What's also really interesting about these photos that you're looking at today is if you look really closely, they are dated. These are going to be original archival photos that we sort of reproduced so that the public can kind of have access to these kinds of materials just to sort of really understand what this place would have looked like back in the day. So we're going to visit it in just a little bit. But if we look all the way back here, this is going to be the superintendent's house. Um, we will be looking at it from the front entrance. This is the back entrance. And basically all of this land that extends outward, these are going to be where you have the plotted fields, all the agricultural systems going on. And then even further beyond this field that you see right here, there would have been cow pastures actually. So they did have cows on site that would have been part of their dairy production here at the Skaya. So we're kind of inferring really as we hear the information that the village was really helping Biscaya be sort of a self-sustaining um, huge home. And also Biscaya is fashioned especially after a lot of Italian villas, which would have also had their own sort of farming sites as well. So James Deering definitely replicates that here in Miami for Biscaya. All right. In addition to this space right here, historically, Staff would have also been able to allow sort of a direct line of communication when it came to telephones. So this entire second level is known as the mezzanine. If we look right here in the corner, this is actually going to be the box that staff would have um, went into in order to operate the switchboard. So James Deering did not have to worry about a third party operator to connect him with whoever he wanted to call. Um, this is how they would have managed to have phones that kind of act exactly as our phones do today. So not only was it sort of allowed for um, or made it possible for sort of guests and staff to use on site, it also sort of connected into the local community as well. Okay. Do you have any further questions before we move on from this space? No? Awesome. As you can see, we no longer use the garage for what it was its, its intended purpose was. Um, but you do see that we do have a lot of tables set up here. We do use the mezzanine for a lot of the storage. Um, here on site for some of the departments. Mine is on this side. But as you can see, we do have these tables. This was used for some training. Um, the garage is often used for training as well as workshops. Um, this past summer, we actually did host Studio Vizcaya, which was a series of artist workshops and a lot of people were invited to come in, sort of partake in a lot of the um, process, processes of art making here in the garage as well. Here is what we now call the machine shop. Um, it was formerly known as the blacksmith shop. James Deering, when he is constructing Vizcaya, does purchase a lot of imported furniture and for his collection. Um, a lot of those imported furniture happen to be antiques and sometimes you could only really buy one of those objects. So on site, James Deering did have artists that he commissioned from Europe in order to build re reproductions. The machine part was especially used for that sort of work. Um, there was an in-house blacksmith that not only made metal parts for the house and for antiques, but also even was able to make a lot of metal parts for um, the maintenance of the cars that he did have on site. Currently, we do use this building again for more conference and meetups. Um, a lot of professional and business personnel congregation, if you will. Um, other names that they are known for is Fight 
fungus. Um, I call them jungle gym trees because that's what I used them for when I was a little girl. And that's also what a lot of the school groups that we have come in, that's what we kind of invite them to do as well. Um, they're also known as strangler figs, and we can get into that just a little bit later. But here we um, also call them our console trees. So these are do hold historical precedence here at Biscaya. They were planted while Biscaya was being constructed. Um, James Deary had an artistic director known as Paul Chalfin and a an landscape architect known as uh, Diego Suarez. So Diego Suarez and Paul Chalfin are really putting together a lot of the plant life here to make up not only the main house um, gardens, but also some of the foliage that you see here around in the village as well. They do bring in these huge trees that you see. Not only are they here, but you will also be able to see these kinds of tree organizations even in the main house side too. Um, we do also understand that they can be invasive, especially here in Florida. Um, they usually are not planted near a lot of roadways because basically how these trees sort of work is their roots don't necessarily stem from the bottom and spread out. What the roots are gonna do actually are drop down from the branches and then anchor themselves to the ground, to the ground and then they're gonna sort of spread out that way. So not only do they grow from top to bottom, but they're really good at just It's going to be the superintendent's house. If you guys would like to take a quick peek inside, you're more than welcome. All of these buildings right and then we talk about their current use and then we talk about the eventual future use that these buildings will have um, and that's really to sort of encourage and kind of interact with the community mm -hmm. if they just so happen to pass by um, we can also make it more accessible sometimes the main house is not accessible to all folks here um, it is a 25 dollars admission if you're lucky during the year and then again during high season those tickets do get expensive um, so here is really just an open place, really, to invite a lot of guests to come in for free, see what we have going on around here, and also eventually one day engage with the history resources that we will have put um, on site for some of these buildings. Um, for the superintendent's house specifically, um, in the past it was used to it used to be inhabited by the superintendent, basically the manager of the operations here going on in the village, what was being received, sort of crop wise and what have you. He would have mostly been situated with his family on this side of the house. The middle of the house is going to be the loja space that sort of connects with the um, outside. Let's just sort of see. Um, for the cafe on the main house side, that's also something they do. They do have sort of um, the crops and stuff that they grow on site. Mm -hmm. And then they use those crops and veggies to sort of implement into their own sort of meals that they have for sale over there. Mm -hmm. And yeah, hopefully this will be done in 2025 the entire thing. <laughs> Even the trough over there is made of the original limestone and some of the more decorative sculptural things that you're looking at here are part of that natural original limestone. So this is going to be the farm plot here in the village. We're going to get into sort of identifying some of these buildings. So on my left side this is going to be known as the dairy barn. Um, we're also going to be looking at those examples of those apartments that are sort of integrated within the same sort of production building. So on the top level right here, that is where a lot of the single men would have sort of inhabited. And then right underneath them is their sort of point of work. So James Deering was very, very um, adamant about having a really sort of seamless streamlined work production. Um, in order to have that, not only is he going to really provide the staff with a lot of um, technology, he's also going to have them live right on top of where they do ex um, have to work. It's kind of the sort of same deal with over here, this building in front of us. This is going to be the poultry barn or the chicken coop. I like to remind myself that this is the chicken barn because the eggs shaped windows that you see right there. Um, that is that building. I believe some of the birds that they had on site were turkeys, guinnesses, never seen a Guinness but I've done my due diligence and research and saw Guinness is there so I'm just letting you all know that's the bird that they had. Um, I think a couple of quails and pheasants if you will into that sort of space that you see right over there and ducks. On this Would side, they ever open this up for people to see? 
eventually that is what this site will turn into. This is really where my department is going to be. Um, we are the community programs, partnerships and interpretations sort of department. Um, I specifically work for school programs and this is where we want the um, educational activation site to be. So we have the dairy barn, we have the poultry barn. On my right side over here, this is going to be the mule barn. So there were mules here. We still use mule and carriage here in Miami. Um, Miami in the 1910s was still very underdeveloped. You had dirt roads. We do call it the farmhouse because we have updated some of the names of these historical buildings. But essentially, this is where a couple more of those families back in the day would have lived here on site if they worked for James Deering. So on this bottom part, you have a fully fledged apartment. And then on the second level, another apartment right up there. So they would have had a complete living room, bedroom, bathroom, and what have you. Also, as well as a full kitchen space too. So they would have been fully equipped and fully accommodated here in this sort of building. Currently, we did sort of take a lot of the stuff that we had stored in it out um, because we are preparing for this building right here to actually be a public available um, archival library. So a lot of the archives and resources we have, we are trying to reproduce them so that the public can kind of engage with the history of the home as well as local Miami for themselves. Um, again, kind of really important for people to have that sort of engagement. Um, kind of makes it a bit more personal as well. You'd like to find out a bit more of where you come from, what sort of existed here at the time and what have you. So we're really hoping that this space gets utilized for that. I think in addition, they're also maybe hoping to have somewhat of an exhibition space as well. So any sort of contemporary artist that would like to be commissioned at Vizcaya and sort of put up a lot of their things up here, that will also be this kind of space. 